Thank you very much, uh, Barry, for the invitation to be here uh, to talk about wonder. Uh, I'm slightly worried now that um, your minds will be filled with how the Rubik Cube got <laughs> into the jar, and you'll be spending the next 20 minutes just turning that over in some corner uh, of your mind. Uh, but I hope I'll be able to offer a few uh, thoughts and questions in the symposium spirit, which will stimulate our thinking as we go through this fascinating day uh, on epistemic insight and big questions, which, uh, and the big questions which David and Tom have so helpfully uh, begun to stimulate us on. Uh, as Berry has said, I do have a bit of a scientific background. My first degree was in physics and philosophy uh, many years ago now in Oxford, and I did spend a few years before going into the church as a physics teacher in secondary schools. So that's my interest in this whole area has been a, a very long one. My day job is as Bishop of Kingston for the Church of England, so I serve an area of London between Kingston uh, on the southwest edge of London and Waterloo in the middle, uh, in the middle of London. So this university is roughly in the middle of the patch, with an extraordinarily interesting patch of London that I am privileged to serve. And I have close links with the university here, uh, including being a professorial fellow. So it's lovely to be here, to be able to address you on this subject of wonder and how we might consider that in the educational scene. Now, I was asked by Berry to talk a little bit about how we might build on children's natural sense of wonder, and in particular, how that might lead to some educational outcomes. As I go along, I'm going to throw in one or two questions which I'll leave hanging uh, for you to think about. Now, one of the first, very first question that came into my mind was about how a child's experience of wonder and that kind of language links with the whole way of thinking when we're talking about educational outcomes. Because it seems to me that the child's sense of wonder is something in its own right. You don't need to look for outcomes from it. It's something that is an end in itself, if you like. It will have outcomes, of course, but you don't generate wonder for the purposes of even more important outcomes. The wonder itself is primary. So that's the first question, about the relationship between a child's basic experience of wonder and the idea of educational outcomes. Now, I'm going to begin telling you a little about, about this little girl, uh, whose name is Ariana. Uh, she happens to be my granddaughter, aged almost two, and I have the great privilege of the grandparental view of a nearly two-year-old, where you're not responsible for, is this child about to fall over and bash their head because there's a parent around who will intervene before you've got anywhere near it. But you can observe the way they're developing and growing. Uh, and I've had the privilege of that now for nearly uh, two years. And what is absolutely obvious in this little girl is how her sense of wonder and curiosity just springs out of her all the time over everything she comes across. And it's very obvious when you look and experience a young child uh, close to that that is deeply, deeply embedded uh, in the young child. And of course, it's infectious because when a young child has an expression like this, and I think this is looking at an aeroplane and seeing how does it fly, and they might be asking eventually when they're much older some <laughs> questions about the physics of flying and how that all works, but it starts with this curiosity, and it's there. And it's infectious because, of course, all the adults around her join in with that sense of wonder and curiosity. And here she is with her father, uh, pointing up, and that again was her f one of her early sights of an aeroplane. And you can see, wow, this is extraordinary, what I'm seeing. And that's absolutely uh, her whole approach to life. So it's there right from the start, 
deeply embedded in the human mind and spirit. So the question, of course, is, well, what happens to that as we grow and mature? And in particular for today, what does the education system, and particularly the formal education system, through which we now put uh, all our children, certainly in a country like this, what does that do to that sense of wonder which is so deeply embedded uh, in a young child? Does it help it or does it hinder it? So what I'm going to do in these comments uh, might be called uh, a wander through wonderland. And I'm going to offer a few reflections about the concept of wonder and the experience of wonder in life. Uh, then a little bit about wonder in science, and Tom and David have already talked a little bit about that. A bit about the place of wonder in religion, and then finish with some thoughts about wonder in education. Uh, so that's roughly where we're going, this little wonder through wonderland. Well, first of all, wonder in life. Well, if you're worried that the sense of wonder completely gets knocked out of us as we uh, grow old, uh, one, there are some very good examples of where the experience of wonder comes right to the fore. And a recent one was the uh, eclipse, solar eclipse, which took place over the summer. And here's a quote, uh, albeit from a theoretical astrophysicist, about the wow factor of all of that. And I think, Tom, I'm right, you actually saw that directly. And I've heard you speak about it, and even a, a, very, a very seasoned scientist like the wow factor is absolutely still there. So that capacity is there deeply in us. Shortest two minutes, 20 seconds of my entire life. Yeah, and very intense uh, experience. So it, doesn't, it certainly doesn't go. A uh, very famous quote from Immanuel Kant, uh, the 18th century philosopher, in the, the conclusion to his critique on practical reason, Two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing awe, the starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. Uh, and that's the mature thinking of the philosopher Immanuel Kant. So those questions, are, those, that experience of wonder is certainly very much there and part of our lives. But before we get too uh, starry-eyed about all of this, I want to push this sense of wonder and curiosity in a slightly different direction. About the existential questions which we ask about our lives and our place in the universe. Because one of the things, if we're not careful, in all our thinking about wonder and awe, that we do so with rather rose-tinted spectacles. And we look at all the wondrous things that are there, the beautiful patterns in the skies and so forth. But of course, a deep part of our experience of life is also some of its awfulness. And I don't see how you can have a sense of wonder if you don't also embrace all of that. You have to have the totality of our human experience in your understanding of wonder and the kind of questions which we want to ask about the world in which we find ourselves. Bishop Richard Harris, the former Bishop of Oxford, who's retired uh, into this diocese, has recently done a book on, called The Beauty and the Horror. And the basic uh, underlying question is how we can understand any talk of God uh, if we don't embrace both the full beauty of life, uh, but also uh, that life can be so appalling as well. So every time we watch a, a, a natural history uh, film and you see uh, the Bambi-like creature fleeing away, looking all very beautiful, and then sooner or later the lion comes along and eats the uh, Bambi figure. And, well, what's that about? Nature is red and in tooth and claw. The apparent cruelty and sheer wastefulness of life. Uh, we've already mentioned the book of Job, and certainly in some of the biblical literature, that question of wonder, not only at the beauty of life, but also at its horror and appallingness, uh, one takes in all of that. And you'll find it in the Psalms as well. There are great Psalms of praise at the wonders of the heavens and the beauty of humankind, but also Psalms of lament at the intense suffering which is around. 
So it seems to me that we have a basic uh, human faculty to wonder, but it does need to embrace all of life if we are going to take in uh, the real big questions and help our, our young people as they grow to experience and answer these questions uh, in that way. It's a very basic uh, human faculty. So wonder in life is certainly there, but we need to include in it both children's innate curiosity, our ability for contemplative reflection, and also the profound uh, existential questions which we all ask. Uh, as Socrates famously said, the unexamined life uh, is not worth living. Uh, it is simply part of being human to ask all these questions and to have that sense of wonder and awe. Before I move on to science, I just want to um, say a word for this awful habit that's come into our English language uh, of describing, wow, that's awesome, uh, when you order your Big Mac and fries, uh, awesome, <laughs> and so forth. Uh, usually that produces a cringe reaction because awesome's applied to everything. But I want to turn that on its head and say that if we truly carry with us some, if you like, of the spirit of that little Ariana that I showed, and we retain that into life, we have a much richer and deeper view of life when we engage with virtually anything. Because as adults, it's very easy to flip through life at not seeing the wonder that is around you and the present moment. So there's a sense in which that awful phrase, wow, that's awesome, uh, is true of everything. And so it's ubiquitous use uh, one might perhaps put in uh, a word of defense for. Let me move on now to the question of wonder in science. And Tom and David have already touched uh, on this in their uh, conversation, which they had very helpfully. And of course, the charge is sometimes uh, that modern science uh, deconstructs wonder. It makes the world rather dull and mechanical and predictable. And Tom quoted that uh, example of uh, young people choosing not to do science because they felt it didn't engage their whole imaginative side. And you think, well, how sad uh, is that? And in a book, famous book by Richard Dawkins, uh, Unweaving the Rainbow, uh, which referred, of course, to uh, the criticism that particularly post-Newton, uh, this modern science had deconstructed the sheer beauty of that rainbow had become a rather uh, dry and dull scientific description of what was really should be a spiritual and wondrous experience. And all the science had deconstructed that uh, into frequencies of light and so on. Uh, Richard Dawkins and that the phrase, unweaving the rainbow, appears uh, in a poem by, by John Keats. Richard Dawkins uh, will have none of that, and he says, uh, quite rightly, science is full of wonder and curiosity. And wonder and curiosity are essential drivers for our science. Whether you come from a religious background uh, or not, that seems to be true. Uh, those of you, I didn't know whether we could get through this day without mentioning Brian Cox, uh, have watched some of his programs. It's very clear that he uh, very much subscribes to that sense of wonder as integral uh, in science. So you absolutely want it central to science. Whether it's looking at the starry skies above, as Kant said, wonderful pictures uh, from NASA of the cosmos, which we, many of us will have looked at, whether it's something to do with the sheer beauty of mathematics and the ability of simple equations to gather up a vast range of phenomena into the most beautiful theories which explain uh, or point to deeper explanations of our world, whether it's relativity or some other area of science, the sheer beauty of the maths which can do that uh, for us. You can't avoid us. Or going back to an earlier era, just think what it must have been like when microscopes first appeared in a serious way. And we have a famous picture from Robert Hooke's Micrographia. And suddenly being able to see much more deeply uh, into the microscopic world. And of course, similarly uh, for telescopes. So wonder in science is absolutely basic, it seems to me. 
Just earlier this week, uh, one of the colleagues I'm working with, along with uh, Tom and David, on a, a major national project equipping Christian leaders in an age of science, uh, described her experience of it was physics education when she was at school. And she said the physics teacher was just so dull. Just so dull. And it put her off, seriously. And you think, how terrible is that? When there is all this uh, to be discovered in science. Or think perhaps of some of those students who have been reduced to in their science lessons, all they really care about is getting the right answer to the question they've just been set so that they can get the grade and then they can move on. That's not education in my book. Uh, we need to be opening children up uh, to the wonder of science. So let me move on now to a few thoughts about uh, wonder in religion. And I'm going to start with a, a closely related concept to wonder, but um, rather different in many other ways, and the idea of worship, which is central to uh, any uh, religion. If you like, it's one of the most distinctive characteristics uh, of uh, religions. And of course, worship involves a great deal of the sense of wonder and awe. Uh, the late 19th century, early 20th century Catholic theologian von Hugel said the first and central act of religion is adoration, the sense of God. And Evelyn Underhill, the Anglican in her 1936 book on worship, said that the religious man, you have to take account that it was written in 1936, uh, is bound to take worship seriously. It points steadily towards the reality of God. It gives, expresses, and maintains that which is the essence of all sane religion, a theocentric basis to life. And elsewhere, she says, worship is the response of the creature to the eternal. Now, that's closely linked to those little responses from Ariana to the world she is experiencing, the response of the creature uh, to the eternal. So for Underhill and von Hugel, in, crucially, worship is rooted in ontology, that which is, discovering uh, the most real. And it involves an understanding of life which says the, most, the deepest level of understanding of reality is found in God and found via worship and wonder. And so there's a real question, and I leave this hanging with you, about what the relationship is between the sense of wonder that we want to encourage uh, in children as they grow up and the understanding of seeing life as it really is. And herein lies a problem, educationally, at quite a deep level, I think, in the philosophy of education. Uh, Underhill, Evelyn Underhill says this about religion and worship. It's possible to regard worship as one of humanity's greatest mistakes, uh, a form taken by the fantasy life, the desperate attempt of bewildered creatures to come to terms with the surrounding mystery. So there's a real question about whether we are in wonderland uh, with uh, the question of worship uh, and the whole negative sense of uh, wonderland about believing six uh, impossible things before breakfast. So there's a real issue here about epistemology, I think, kicking around uh, underneath this. And you'll find this if you, those of you who've read the Discworld books by Terry Pratchett, or, or those of you who've read uh, Yuval Harari's relatively recent book, Sapiens, underlying both of those, there is an idea that all these religious ideas, all these theological ideas, and indeed many other concepts that we use, are simply constructs of the human mind. They have no more ultimate reality than that. And that becomes uh, a real question, I think, in the philosophy of religion. Uh, there are real questions about truth and reality and how we understand it. And the relationship between our sense of wonder and what that's telling us about what is true in our understanding of the world. And so there are questions of truth and reality 
in religion. And a couple of little sketches which you can read uh, that point into some of that debate. There are plenty of our contemporaries who think all this theological talk uh, is just nonsense. It's not real knowledge, it's just private opinion. Uh, and that's all there is to it. And the sooner we shove that off the educational table, the better uh, can be uh, the view. Uh, as you might imagine, that's not my view. Uh, I think theology does point us towards truth in a very important way. Uh, there are also, of course, important questions about truth and reality in science. Uh, there are quite a lot of questions about under, in the philosophy of science about the way in which our theories map onto that which really is. And a couple of little sketches which introduce you to that. So there are real questions uh, about how our capacity to wonder and our curiosity relate to our search for truth and what really is. Because I think in education, we want to think we are educating young people in that search for truth. And that's a very important part uh, of what we do. Uh, St. Augustine described humanity as the community of truth. We are truth-seeking animals. Uh, Harvard University has as its motto, veritas, truth, uh, as the single word. So that's enough, I think, on for now. I'm going to finish with a few words on uh, the idea of uh, wonder in education. There are deep questions of truth uh, in education. So wonder in education, and a couple of things here, just to finish with. And I want to start with the practice of collective worship which, at least in this country, is still a legal requirement uh, for everybody in school to engage in collective worship. So I think it's important that we wrap that also into our conversation and what goes on there. Uh, I did a part-time doctorate at King's College London looking at collective worship in the 1990s, uh, and I've got no reason to think that things have moved on uh, in terms of the fundamental issues uh, since then, really. And... The point I want to make is this, that underlying the practice of collective worship, where issues of wonder and awe uh, are very central, uh, an understanding of religious belief, and this is what my research uh, led to, there's an implicit message about the nature of religious belief. And the implicit message was this, that religious belief is essentially an individually chosen private practical guide to living. Individually chosen, private, practical guide to living. The current pra the practice of collective worship sh uh, veers away from questions about the cognitive content and the truth claims of religion. Uh, and they almost go into the too difficult box. So it's very important, and I want, the question I want to leave you with is how to use collective worship creatively uh, in this developing this sense of wonder and where that fits in without the unintended consequence of playing into uh, an idea that religion and religious belief and religious language is simply private and subjective and in the opinion box. Now, just to uh, finish off, um, question also about the nature of science and the place of wonder in science education. Uh, some of uh, Berry's research, and I know this has been done uh, by some others as well, have led to the idea that a lot of our young people, when they go through their science education in schools, are ending up either as little scientists, in other words, science answers all the real questions, and also with a conflict narrative of science and religion. Those aren't deliberately taught... But nevertheless, because of the way the science curriculum is shaped and the lack of opportunity to talk about some of the wider questions, uh, that's the result of what goes on uh, at the moment. Barry will be able to talk to you that, about that in a much more uh, informed way. But there's a real question in my mind about how we teach science in a way, more rounded, more holistic way. And I know we're going to come on, on to that in the afternoon. So just to summarise, I think there are some key questions uh, in education if we're going to think about wonder. There are some existential questions. There are some ontological ones about our relationship with reality. 
There are some epistemological ones about where we think this takes us in the place of truth. And there are also some moral ones. So I think there needs to be, there is real place for cross-disciplinary conversation, for thinking very hard, as we're doing in this uh, symposium, about the nature of science teaching and the unnatural compartmentalization of our subject matter, which is a relatively new kid on the block uh, historically, and how we might uh, improve on that. So what I want to end up with is an idea that we do really do need a cross-disciplinary approach if we're going to ask, answer fundamental questions, such as what it means to be human. And I know we're pushing on time, so I'm going to draw to a close. Uh, that cross-disciplinary conversation seems to be incredibly important and how we create opportunities for that to happen in our schools. That's the challenge and that's what we need to think about because very often, and Tom was, and David were talking about this as well, how all that stuff uh, mixes in and actually begins to happen because uh, I certainly want people to have a wonderful view of reality and not simply a blinkered and narrow one so that eventually the little spirit of Ariana can pervade rather more of our education system than perhaps it does uh, at the moment. So thank you for that and hopefully we can move on to questions. Thank you. <laughs>